So can we backtrack a bit again, Roger, to just to show some principles of how the school and the parents get involved? Okay. The, what the school needs, what the parents need is to have a school who's going to be respectful of their authority. What the, what the school needs is to know that they have legal authority to actually teach the children. And so what they need from, for each child that comes to them, they need to identify who, are, who, have, who has legal authority over that child. Now that's very simple, where the child comes from a family founded on marriage. They basically need authority from the family, and that is from the husband and the wife acting jointly. So, unfortunately, because of what's happened with these uh, law reforms over the last 50 years, uh, there are far too many families now that are fractured. Uh, prior to that, uh, a school would have been able to accept uh, the signature and authority of one spouse on behalf of the family, and there, there wouldn't have been any problem with that. Nowadays, what a school needs to do is to create a, an enrolment form that covers them in a legal way. So what they need to do is to make sure that they have uh, an application from, that is, uh, has, carries the authority of both spouses. That is the only way today that they can ensure that they're not getting into uh, legal hot water. So the sort of problems that could arise by not having that are? Well, uh, it is a criminal offence under Section 17 of the Non-Fatal Offences Against the Person Act for any person to hold or detain a child against the wishes of a person who has lawful control of that child, and that is a spouse. Yes. So if the school were to take the child on the authority of one spouse alone, the other spouse would be uh, well, well within their rights to file a criminal complaint against the school. Now, nobody wants that to happen, and the best thing is to make sure for, to, for that the school cover themselves, that they have the signatures, i.e. the authority, of both spouses. And that must be very clear on their forms, that they are, that, that they are requiring the authority of both spouses. And in the unhappy event that the spouses are not living together, they must ensure that they take the, the addresses and telephone numbers, contact numbers of both spouses, uh, because they, when the school, in its relationship with the family, needs to speak equally to both spouses without any discrimination whatsoever, one against the other. So what sort of problems are coming around as a result of this, we're talking about a system whereby one, a form with one signature once did, did the job. Yes. Schools are, would be uh, forgiven, perhaps, for expecting to deal with ju just one parent, that is the parent with the, who has the signature, who has signed the form. What happens when another parent comes around looking to pick up the child, to um, talk to the principal, to uh, complain about anything, and that parent is is part of a fractured family. Okay. What you're what you're talking about is is the obvious and inevitable result of the school not doing its job properly. Mm -hmm. Because if the school does uh, uh, secure for itself in advance the legal authority from both spouses then it has done everything that it needs to do. Yes. It then simply uh, respects that legal authority by making sure that each parent gets all the notes, gets invited to all the parent 
associations, to all the parent meetings, that they get sent out school reports. They need all of those things. And that's the school's job. And if a parent goes and has to complain to a school, then the school is at fault. And the school should immediately rectify the situation by reviewing its, uh, you know, the, the, the Department of Education requires each school to have uh, an admissions and participation policy. Now that policy has to respect the authority of families. And do those policies not conform with, with having respect for the family? I'm afraid through whatever means, I, you know, it's not up for me to say, but the vast majority now of schools have decided, and I think they're, they're, they are being uh, advised by uh, solicitors and by patrons, they're being, they're actually uh, now uh, foul, falling foul of the legal system. They are not complying with the law. Uh, they are, they are, if you like, taking sides in the family and interfering with the family where they have no right to do so. And the trouble is, is that the minister does not want to do that. The minister seems to uh, be against the good of families, unfortunately. Roger. If you had an example whereby the forms for admission were being done correctly by the use of two signatures, it is still possible, is it not, for a parent to exercise a preference moving their child out of that school? After they've enrolled the After child. they've enrolled them. Is it, is oh, it? absolutely, yeah. And so, how does what you're suggesting a parent, stop problems from yeah, still arising? A parent, a parent has what's called a veto. Yes. Okay. Their job is to protect their child and to act in the child's best interests. Now, it's obvious to anybody that once a parent has decided that one school is the best place for that child to go, that at any time, if they have any suspicion or evidence that the school is not the right place, it's not a good place for that child to be, they are entitled to withdraw their, their, their uh, authority and to physically go and get their child. Yes. Now, what that means, you know, is, is a private matter then between the family to sort out. What it really means is that the school... No one, sh no one should interfere with that. If there, if there yeah, is a dispute, going to say. If there is a dispute between the parents, then if everybody leaves the family alone, they will eventually sort it out. That's right. If yeah. people start That's interfering with it, they are going to upset that very important dynamic, that healthy dynamic that needs to exist in every family, where opinions are aired and people make a decision after a, you know a period of discussion and. Right. Can you outline for for me, Roger, how family law court orders? take a part in interfering in this process? Yeah, that is a very serious thing that's going on, is that completely unlawfully, people, uh, a spouse who I described earlier, in technical terms being a deserter, i.e. they don't want to listen to the other spouse, they don't want to have to take the other spouse's uh, views on board at all. And, uh, I mean, they could be having an affair with somebody else or they could just simply, you know, be fed up with that marriage and want out of it. And they now decide, you know, that they're going to do everything themselves without consulting the other spouse and getting their, their consent. Uh, now, in a situation like that, what is going on now is that the solicitors are advising those those spouses, the deserter, to go to court and to get a court order to actually side with their views and to and to override the other spouse's 
uh, authority, and they 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 are getting orders which say a ridiculous thing like to dispense with the other spouse's consent. Specifically in relation to schooling. To schooling, yes. Yes. Now that is that is entirely mythical. I mean, that, that could never happen. The only time, the only time that a, uh, the Supreme Court have said that one spouse's consent can be uh, uh, disposed of is where there is uh, desertion. That's proven desertion, mm -hmm. not just somebody saying, oh, I think you're a deserter, therefore we're going to do this. Proven desertion, i.e. Uh, a court order saying that they're a deserter, mm -hmm. where the other spouse is in prison or the other spouse is, uh, has been uh, put into a mental institution because they do not have a sound mind, to make, sound mind to make decisions. Those are the only instances. And what about medical incapacitation, like Alzheimer's disease? Isn't there? Would that not be covered? In? Well, if if you if 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 that is sufficient, that the person doesn't have a sound mind to make decisions. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, but they're the only three instances. They're the only they're three instances. So the whole idea and of the desertion, unfortunately, you know, is that the the, the the law that would have allowed you to prove desertion. Uh, which is actually called the restitution of conjugal rights, that that was abolished in 1988. So really what we're talking about is uh, is where some uh, spouse is in prison or they've been uh, uh, put into a, a mental institution against their will. This is not where they voluntarily... So we're talking go. about extreme situation very, very here extreme. which would allow very, only very, to override very a very fundamental yeah. right. So any court that is going around, that is, that is, uh, you know, giving out such an order, is not acting in any way in the within the law. Yes, they certainly aren't acting morally, but they are actually acting immorally. They're actually well, uh, <laughs> immorally, but more important, I think, people need to know that you know that it is against the law. Yes. The uh, the passport office are also guilty of this. On, on a passport form, <coughs> they say, where, which requires obviously the consent and authority of both spouses, they have a section in it which says that if one of the spouses does not want their child to have a passport, then the other spouse should, it says, should, should, yep, should go to the district court and get an order dispensing with the consent of the other spouse. That's a very strange thing. A very, very serious violation. Are you saying if one violation. of, the, if one of the, those parents don't want it, yep. the other one should? Yep. It's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. Now that is a classic example of how the state is purposely creating conflict within the family.